I think my family would tell you that I, um, I don't have a bad temper. I hope that my family would tell you that I don't have a bad temper, that I'm not one of those people that just kind of just explodes or, uh, you know, is always kind of like, uh, all the time. Now, not all the time, you know, there, when I watch, I, I'm a Cowboys fan, and um, when I watch football, <laughs> what was that, Brad? Uh, when I watch football, uh, my family knows when the Cowboys are doing well or when they're not doing well, and I don't know any other way to describe this or let you know what it's like than to just try to emulate exactly how I sound, and it's a, a little embarrassing. And don't tell me that you don't make like these types of noises, whether it's traffic for you or something else. Um, but for me, it's the Cowboys, and it's like these are some of the things that come out of my mouth. Why? Why? No, not again. Not again. This is ridiculous. This is, oh yeah, they'll find a way. It's fourth quarter. They're going to find a way to lose this. I cannot believe this. Now, I wish I was exaggerating. Um, I, I think that, that if you ask my kids, they might tell you, no, it, that was a little bit of it, but it's a little bit worse than that. And I don't know. I mean, if I could, you know, probably I can and probably I'll get better, but that's how I watch football sometimes. Um, but... I have a story about this because the year, <laughs> this is what I love. Why? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go backwards a lot. So don't just, stop. okay, here we go. All right, okay, this is fun. Talk amongst yourselves for a second. Um, talk about the 1992 Super Bowl 27. Oh, there we go. There we go. The year was 1992. I was doing a youth party, Okay. Um, and this was it, was, it was a Super Bowl type of party, but I wanted it to end really quickly, and I had a very specific reason for that, because the Cowboys were playing the Bills in the Super Bowl, and I wanted to watch the game. So I took my VCR, I, you kids, there used to be this thing called a VCR, and they had tapes and stuff, and you could program it, okay, so you put the tape in there, and with a complicated scheme and code, and like a, kind of a, a blood sample, you could tell it what time and day to start, and then what time it's going to finish. Now, what I didn't fully realize, because I had never really programmed a VCR like that, I just pressed record when I wanted to record something, is that you cannot mess this up. Once you program a VCR to record something and it starts, you can't eject that tape. And for good reason. That's so nobody could come into the room and mess up your recording. But the youth party ended early. It was Super Bowl Sunday, and I was recording the game. And I couldn't get that tape out of the VCR. It was infuriating. Like, I, what, what am I going to do? And the kids, they're like listening to the radio. And you know how those students are. They, they were enjoying this. All right. And the party was over. They should be going home, and I should be watching my game. But they were telling me the score. And... Um, they told me I knew the score all the way up to the fourth quarter. And here's why that matters. The game didn't start out well for the Cowboys. Here's, here's what happened. We had the punt on our first possession. We had three, almost like a three and out, and they blocked our punt. And it got all the way down to the 16-yard line. And in four plays, they scored a touchdown. 7-0 Bills. Thurman Thomas ran for a two-yard touchdown. Then Dallas, we got uh, all the way to our own 40-yard line the next drive, but Mark Tuane, one of our offensive linemen, was caught for an illegal formation. And then Troy Aikman throws two incompletions, and, um, and then we had to punt. And then the Bills got the punt and were driving down the field because of a roughing the passer, allegedly, on Leon Lett. <laughs> And then a 21-yard pa pass from Jim Kelly to Andre Reed. Great, great players. It was horrible. I mean, we were definitely going to lose. But you know what? You know what I wasn't doing? I wasn't freaking out. I mean, I was pretty chill. I was actually smiling. I was like, okay, not bad, but who cares? And you know why? Because my students had told me the final score. 52 to 17 Cowboys. Listen, man, when you know that the, the victory like is yours, 
you don't freak out when bad things happen. And so I could watch the game in complete peace because somebody in my youth group had already told me the fourth quarter score. Here's one thing I want us to know. Well, last week uh, and the week before, we said dark is real in week one. Look, you're not imagining things. You're actually in a battle. And number two, dark is powerful. There's wreckage all around you, and the lies are strong. And yes, we see people and, and, uh, that, that are ruining their lives, and we, we, even in our own life, because these lies are very powerful. But what if? What if somebody told you the final score? See, we don't fight for victory as believers. We fight from victory. When it comes to the dark, we can often feel like we're in the first quarter of a game that's not going our way. When, when we look around at the world, we can say, oh, this is not going well. When attacked, we will feel uncertain, we'll feel anxious or feel um, afraid, like the outcome is somehow still up in the air. But that's not the reality because somebody has already told us the ending score. Jesus wins, and it's not even close, right? It's, it's, even, it's even more of a, a, a gap than 52-17. The dark is powerful, yeah. But dark is defeated. Then, well, uh, you might be thinking, well, then why do I see so much evil? Why, I mean, why is there so much violence? Why is there so much abuse? Why so much anxiety? Why, why are people fearful? Why are they depressed? Why so much, why so much sin, right? Why so much rebellion against God? Well, I have a couple of illustrations for this. I don't watch boxing much. Maybe you do. Um, or, or maybe like uh, MMA or something like that, but I don't watch that very much because it just kind of, I don't know, I just don't like seeing somebody get beat senseless. But sometimes I'll see a YouTube clip of somebody that gets knocked out. They counted them out, they counted the 10, defeated, completely and totally defeated. And then the trainer gets him up, and that fighter, there's something still in him that wants to fight, and so he's flailing around hitting his trainer, hitting his coach, hitting the referee, and everybody's just trying to, you know, glom onto him. Why? Because he's so furious that he lost the fight that he just wants to do damage. And that's the kind of enemy we face. It's, it's, it's been over for 2,000 years, and yet our enemy, Satan, the devil, he still wants to do as much damage as he possibly can. That's one picture. But the other one that I like the most is when Amy and I first got married, we were dirt poor, like seriously poor. Our date night consisted of us watching on our TV, which sat on the carpet. Um, we, we watched Star Trek The Next Generation and played skip bow. Like every time we were going to go out on a date, that's all we could afford. We would eat chicken nuggets sometimes if life was good, you know. And then right after Star Trek The Next Generation, a show came on called Cops. In fact, two of them in a row, bad boys, bad boys, what you going, I, I mean, I loved it. And I loved it because all these, you know, the bad people, the good guys were getting, getting the bad guys. And the, there was this one guy, he was under a plastic swimming pool in the backyard where a cop had just chased him into the backyard. He was like, oh, he's nowhere. I guess he was a ghost. The cop looks down, shines the flashlight on the plastic uh, swimming pool, which is turned over and covering this guy, he just kicks it. And this guy's like in a fetal position under there. It's like, yeah, all right, good cop work. But every single time they would corner somebody or even have them in handcuffs, this defeated, totally arrested person would still fight. Or, or I, I remember one scene where this guy was in handcuffs in a squad car and he's actually trying to kick out the windows of the car to escape. There was no escape, it's over. But still, still flailing around, still seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's the kind of enemy we face. Arrested, done, it's over, but I will do as much damage as I can. What if this frenzy of stuff that we see around us is actually pointing to our enemy's defeat instead of the victory? So how do we stop giving the enemy in our lives and in the world more credit than he deserves? How do we find freedom from things like guilt? and shame, and addictions, and even relational drama? What if there really is a way to fight from victory rather than for victory? Well, the good news, and this good news turns out to be really old news, 
Uh, hopefully you know this already, but Satan is a defeated enemy. It's over. He is defeated. He, he's, and by the way, it's not even close. He's a completely defeated, wannabe God, attempting to use all of the things that you think you lack to steal your worship and destroy your life. God wants to be absolutely clear about this. Uh, that Satan, and, and what does Satan want to do? He wants to hide this fact. I'm not really beat. Well, you, you just wait. I'm going to come back. No, it's over. He wants to hide it using deception and distraction. He wants to use your own desires against you to convince you that he's more powerful. Now listen, you may have questions about this. I didn't say this earlier, but if you're a first timer, we do something called Q&R at the end. And if you want to ask questions, please do. We want to get to as many of them as we can, and if we don't, we go uh, on a podcast that you can find on Spotify, and it's called One More Thing. If you haven't seen the first two weeks, then I really encourage you to review them, because um, this week we're going to look at the total, permanent, and irreversible defeat of Satan. The total, permanent, and irreversible defeat of Satan. How it was accomplished, what it means for you and me, how to live out that victory in real time. So, but, so first, let's keep something in mind. That's pretty important. I've said it before. This victory was not, it's not even close. It's a complete loss, a humiliating loss, a permanent and irreversible loss. Listen to Colossians 2, 14 through 17. This was a letter that Paul, uh, who was a missionary in the first century, he wrote this letter to this church in the re region of Colossae. And here's what he says. He's, he's talking about what did Jesus accomplish? He, he's talking about Jesus, he canceled the record of charges against us and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. Our verdict, our guilt, and I don't know if you guys know this, but if you've lived life for any length of time, you've, you've broken some laws. I'm not talking about Nebraska laws. I'm talking about God laws. Jesus said, you know, you heard that you can't commit adultery. I'm here to tell you that if you look at someone and you lust after them, then that's just like committing adultery. Anybody guilty in here want to raise your hand? Okay, okay, good. Somebody did. I appreciate that. Let's give that person a hand. Jesus says, you know, you've heard that, you know, you can't commit murder, but I'm saying if you're angry at somebody, you kind of committed murder in your heart. Anybody ever been angry at somebody? Okay, yeah, murders. Um, he said, you know, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't lie. That's a, that's a way of that's a way of rebelling against God. Jesus raises the bar all the time. Everybody in here is a lawbreaker. You're not perfect. You know one way you can test to see whether you're perfect or not? You just have to tell your, somebody that's close to you, you just need to tell them, you know what, I'm not perfect. And then wait and see if they look shocked. <laughs> I mean, if they do something like, what? You know, that's, that's like, then you might be close. But nobody in this room is perfect. We have stacked up a record of wrongs against God. And our verdict, our guilt, that law that kept us from God, whatever Satan was, can you guys see me now? Um, what Satan was hoping to win, he was, and what was he hoping to do? He was ho hoping to take as many of you with him away from God as he could. And Jesus won that victory. And, what, and, and how did, what did that do? In this way, by, by canceling that record, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. Why? Because what do they use? They use guilt and shame. A lot of you guys have messed up. You really have messed up. You've really broken God's law. But what does the enemy come and do right after that? He comes to you and he says, that's all you'll ever be. You're unlovable, you're unforgivable, you're irredeemable, you'll never be anything. And that lie keeps being repeated and repeated and repeated to you. And what does Jesus do? He disarms. The Greek word there is he strips away that weapon. You can't use guilt and shame anymore because all the guilt and shame was put on the cross in me. I took it. You can't use it anymore. And that's powerfully what Jesus did on the cross. He shamed them publicly. People thought that the cross was a shameful death, and Jesus turns everything upside down. He says, you think you're shaming me? You should be. You're ashamed, because I took it all, and I didn't have to. I did it out of love. You can't use those weapons anymore, because I've stolen them from you. 
and he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Looked like a defeat, but it was a victory, and it's complete victory. What Jesus really did, and what Paul here is alluding to, is this tradition in Rome. If a Roman emperor marches into a country, defeats them, what he does is he captures all of their rulers and all of their army, and he throws what they called a triumph in Rome. See, triumph isn't just about victory. It's about an in-your-face victory. So he would throw a triumph through the streets of Rome, and he would ride a chariot and lead this triumph. And everybody behind him was kind of walking like this. He had a little bit of his, his legion there right behind him. But behind that is the former enemies. And the enemies had to walk like this because they were chained. And even their rulers, their rulers weren't riding on a chariot. They were just like everybody else. And he was humiliating them. Man, when you do victory like that, you know what you're saying? I don't fear a comeback. I'm not afraid of you guys, you know, re, you know reestablishing your country and coming back. There will be no revenge. It's over. This is the original in your face. What are you going to do about it that, that, that Rome would do? And that's what Jesus did to our enemy. What are you going to do about it? It's over. It is a total, permanent an irreversible defeat. And how did Jesus accomplish this? By the cross. Well, by the cross, but why the cross? Because you and I had an enemy that we could not overcome. Everybody in here, in an unedited moment in your world, in your life, I mean, have feared the fact that you're not permanent, that, that your body is going to die. Every one of us have had that moment where we go, oh, I... I'm not here forever. I fear, I fear death. And so what did Jesus do? Because we were, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son of Man, or the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. There's a lot of theology here, by the way. A lot. In fact, if you want to study that part, Hebrews 2, 14 through 15, I highly recommend it. But the reason that God became flesh is because you and I are flesh. He became like us. And he faced every temptation just like us. And he defeated it, even though we couldn't. And, and the breaking of the power of death, because Jesus didn't stay dead. He proved that death is defeatable, not by us, but by him. So he, we didn't win the victory, but he did. And the ultimate freedom that we have in light of that victory. When Jesus won, he set free all those enslaved by death. Listen to this. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. That's everybody in here. He has set you free from the fear of sin and what sin does. It kills you. He set you free. If, if you're not here, I mean, if you're here and you don't feel free, then you can be. You don't have to walk out of these doors the same people that walked in. And the reason is because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, not anything that you can do. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We're not, we're not, it's not you and me up against Satan, thank God. We would, we would get destroyed. It's us saying we're with him. I'm with him. Colossians 1 makes this really clear, that this is about what Jesus did, and we're inherit, we, we inherit what Jesus did. Listen to Colossians 1, 12. He has enabled you. He has enabled you. you. You didn't do this yourself. He has enabled you. That's talking about Jesus there. To share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Now, the dark matters, but the light matters more. Because that's God's kingdom. That's the, the kingdom of the Son of God. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. And he's transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. Who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. The dark held power over us. Through the law. Through the fact that we were lawbreakers. We were rebels. We didn't even want to worship God. And then Jesus came while we were still rebels. Still sinners. And he took all of our shame and all of our guilt and all of our sin upon himself. He became sin on our behalf, gave his life, defeated sin and death. 
The dark held power over us, but it never held any power over Jesus. He was never intimidated. He was never unsure of the outcome. He knew that he was going to win. Um, and why is that? It's because dark doesn't fight light. It just submits to it. You guys don't have any dark switches at your house, do you? Like when you walk into a room and it's too bright, you just flip the dark switch and the dark comes on and just defeats the light. Why don't we have a dark light, a, a dark switch? It's because the dark doesn't can't fight the light it just submits it just does what light tells it to do there's no such thing as that did you know that that's the way it works in your life did you know that you don't have to be a slave whatever it is whatever you're addicted to whatever you're made anxious by did you know that it's the light that defeats the darkness in your life it's not even close you you don't have to be guilty you don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be in darkness. You can really be transferred from this kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And when that happens, by faith in Christ and what he did, then that, that total, permanent, irreversible victory is your victory because you're with him. Even if we're hurt, even if we get wounded, even we live in a broken world, even if life doesn't turn out exactly the way we want it, even if that person does betray us, even if uh, you know, our bank account is drained, even if the car breaks down, we, are still, we know the end score. Yes, things might look bad, but we can be at peace, peace that doesn't make any sense because we know the ending, that Jesus is going to make all the sad things come untrue, that he is going to win a complete and total victory, new heaven, new earth, new us. That's why we don't have to be in despair. Even, we don't have to be buried in guilt, shame, addiction. Nothing can separate you and me from this great love demonstrated by Jesus Christ. Nothing. Listen to Romans 8, quite possibly one of my favorite sections of the Bible. Listen to this. No, despite all these things, your bank account, who betrayed you, your own sin, despite all these things, despite the diagnosis or the loss or the wound, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us, and I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. We have, it's a defeated enemy. In Christ, not because of you, not because of me, I'm not that cool and I'm not that spiritual. I'm just, I'm just so thankful for what, for what Jesus did. We have complete victory over the enemy, complete freedom from sin and all of its effects, including death, and complete access to the love of God the Father. But as children of our King, and servants of the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his son. We also don't have to grant any authority in our life to this defeated enemy. We don't have to walk around wondering what's he gonna do next. We don't have to shake hands and say, you know what, I should be ashamed or I am guilty. Instead, we can claim the authority that, that Jesus gave to his disciples. Listen to this in Luke 10. This is to 72 specific disciples, but I think it's transferable. Here's what he says, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among the snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. By the way, before you start trying to experiment with this, Jesus here is talking metaphorically, and you can see this in the next part of this verse, so don't make plans for your snake and scorpion room right now. All right. But don't rejoice because evil spirits, when he was talking about snakes and scorpions, he was talking about these people or these entities that want to do damage to you. But don't rejoice just because these evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. In other words, I want a victory that is so much bigger than this authority that I'm giving you. Uh, I am giving you this authority. You don't have to be afraid of the enemy, but I gave you a victory so much greater by paying your penalty on the cross. 
Romans 16, 20 says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. He's defeated, but one day it will be, you know, it will be complete. It's kind of the now he's defeated, but not yet because he's still flailing around. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Now, neither one of these verses are really about you. Neither one of them are about you winning some sort of victory. They're all about living in the victory that Jesus already won. It's us saying, I'm with him. It's us finally realizing that he's the one that's telling the truth. And all this time that I've been believing these lies, it turns out the devil is a liar. Yeah, that's that's what it turns out. It's like all those things that he says, oh, this will meet your need. Oh, that didn't work? Okay, well then maybe a little stronger one. How about that? Or maybe you need more money in your account. Why don't you just cheat on your taxes or cheat on your wife? It doesn't matter. Whatever you have, whatever you need, that gap in your life, I can fill it. Well, it turns out he's a liar. He parades around pretending to be bigger than God or even equal with God. It's a lie. He pretends that you're unforgivable. It's a lie. He pretends that you're too bad. It's a lie. He pretends that he has what you need to take your mind off your depression or your anxiety or your struggle. It's a lie. He pretends to be able to tell you your identity, and he wants you to think it has something to do with your sexuality or your bank account or your politics. It's a lie. The devil is a liar, and he's a defeated one. That's why we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. That's who we are. This is a pretender. So what does that mean for you and me? How do we live in that reality? I think we need to do at least three things. We need to find the lie. What lie have you been believing? What lie have you bought? What, how did you shake hands and maybe sign the contract and you ask, I, I am unforgivable, I am unlovable, I am irredeemable, because that's what he wants you to believe that you, you have what I need, that next thing is gonna meet my needs. Whatever it is, find the lie. Because he's lying uh, all the time. He's the father of lies. That's his native tongue. Find the lie and then evict it. Get rid of that lie. You don't need it. Kick it out. Say, that, that one's gone. But you can't stop there because the lies are gonna continue to come. You have to replace that lie with truth. We find truth in Scripture. We find we ought to be rehearsing truth all the time. The enemy's primary weapon is deception, and our weapon is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And his goal is to keep you from living in freedom in Christ, and our weapon is to abide in Christ so that we can live in that freedom. He whispers lies about your identity and your purpose and your authority. When it comes to your identity, the enemy wants you to believe that you're unworthy or unloved or unforgivable, but the truth is you're a child of God, and nothing can separate you from the love of God. He wants to lie to you about your purpose and tell you that you're too old or you're not skilled or you don't have any, you don't have any talents or anything. Just Put it on cruise control and wait till you die. Wait until you just assume room temperature, food for worms, pushing up daisies. You've got no purpose. Just wait it out. But the truth is, God has redeemed you for his purpose. You're his workmanship. You're a masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he planned for you. When it comes to authority, he wants you to believe that you're powerless, but the truth is you have the authority that Christ gave you. It's Christ's authority. He says this in Matthew 28. He says, all authority has been given to me, so go. Now, what does that mean? That means he's transferring that authority. He's saying, you have what I have, so go. Make disciples. I did that. You do it. It's your turn. How do we evict these lies? How do we get rid of the lies about identity, purpose, and authority? We talk to the truth teller, right? Prayer. We submit to God's authority through prayer. Prayer is how we align ourselves with God. Prayer is how we fight. We don't fight for the victory. We fight from the victory. And we talk to the one who won the victory. And he tells the truth. And as we pray, we, live, we learn how to live in it. And we stand firm against the enemy's plans, the enemy's schemes. Well, that's a lot of theology today. And I figure that maybe you got a lot of questions about it. So let's see whether anybody has asked some questions. I understand how Satan can be involved in man's unrighteous behavior. Can we say that Satan is involved in natural disasters, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes? Such a great question. This world is fallen. It's broken. I don't believe that 
floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes would have, would have existed in, in, in a perfect world, and I don't think they'll exist in new creation. And so I would say that the, that the choice of man to rebel against God broke something fundamental. It was the lie that got it started, but I'm not going to give Satan the authority, and he's not pointing hurricanes where to go or tornadoes where to go. Um, we just live in a broken world. We knocked down that domino of rebellion, and we broke things. And now it's like the butterfly effect. It's like we broke this. It was a little thing. No, it affected everything. Um, it affected our, our own physical bodies. It affected our relationships. We know this. I don't have to convince you that we live in a world that while potentially is awesome, we find new and different ways to screw it up all the time. I think our original screw up was that rebellion against God and it broke everything. The New Testament says that creation is groaning. From when? From the rebellion of Satan? No. The creation is groaning in anticipation of Jesus coming back from the fall of man. We broke it. So um, it's one of those things where kind of we only, we only have to blame ourselves for the world that we're currently living in. Uh, like I always say, if you're stuck in traffic, you're not stuck in traffic. You are traffic. We're part of the problem. If Jesus was going to get rid of all the sin in the world tomorrow, or if he was going to snap his fingers and get rid of all the evil in the world right now, if he just snapped his fingers, got rid of all the evil, there would not be one person in this room. We've all got a little of that. We, we're, we're saved and we're the righteousness of Christ, but we've all got a little stuff that we haven't given over to him. So uh, that's the thing. I, I, that's why this is Q&R, by the way, because some of these are huge, big questions, and listen to the podcast. We'll delve into that a little bit more. So how is Judas separated from God, Jesus? The enemy took him. Is Judas forgiven since Jesus defeated death and the enemy? Well, you have a couple of questions here. Was Judas a believer? And I will tell you what a believer means. A believer has to have an accurate view of Jesus himself. A believer would have to say, you are who you say you are. And it seems to me as you read the New Testament that Judas wanted a shortcut, and that's usually how the enemy lies to us. Judas wanted a shortcut. He wanted a political leader. He also wanted a little bit of cash. And so he sold, he sold out Jesus for a little bit of cash. Um, it seems like throughout all of the New Testament, Judas is shown as somebody who was on the take. He would steal from the offerings. It, it seems like he was kind of a serpent among them. And Ju Jesus knew that. But the whole time, so he, did, he wasn't separated from God in, in as much as he just was never connected with God. Never. And Paul, in Romans 8, is talking to people who have believed. He's talking to people who have been adopted into his family. He's talking to people who have been sealed by the Spirit. And so Judas, regrettably, and I don't know, I don't know Judas's end story. None of us do. Uh, uh, it, you know, I guess I would say it wouldn't make me sad to see Judas in heaven, but I don't see any evidence in Scripture that he ever repented um, and that he ever, that he ever expressed faith in Jesus as who he really was. It's a great question. You guys are asking really good ones. Wasn't the Cowboys Super Bowl VCR recorded over your wedding video? <laughs> All right, could somebody remove Hannah and Rachel and Chloe from the auditorium? <laughs> I don't think so. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to ask. I'm gonna have to ask Amy that. Now, that's very funny. Got a comedian in here. Very nice thought about praying, but I'm more private than this. That might have been about. Um, um, it, it, here's one thing I want to, I, I love that thought. The first century church knew nothing about private Christianity. We have a personal relationship with Christ, but there's nothing ever spoken about being private about it. We do life in community. And so what I, and I think everybody's got barriers, right? We've all got things that, that actually are standing in the way of us and maturity. 
I would ask, are you private about everything? Do you tell people when you're hungry? Um, are you private about every single thing in your life? Like if you have a need, then maybe that might be a growth area for you. Um, you know, if, it, if you go into a, uh, I can't, I, if you go to a counselor and they just talk and talk and you never say anything, I don't think growth is gonna happen there. And so I just wanna nudge you a little bit. You're probably not private about everything in your life, and so why carve away a part of your life, your, namely your spiritual growth, and say that's the part that I'm private about? I get it, I mean, it is weighty, and, and you might feel ashamed, but look, the Holy Spirit is love. God's Holy Spirit is love, so you, and, and it's called a comforter. So you, there's nothing to be, really be afraid of when it comes to coming to God through prayer because he's not the voice of the enemy. He's not gonna shame you, not gonna point out your flaws, except to say, I love you in spite of those, and let's move beyond them. They're not meeting your needs. They're doing damage to you. How about we walk away from that and you walk towards me because I actually have what you need. God's not trying to keep you from fun. He's not trying to keep you from doing things that are gonna fill you up, and instead he's trying to keep you from destruction. That's why Jesus says the, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came to give you life and give it abundantly. That's John 10.10. 10. I wanna give you a big life. So, you know, abide in me. Thank you for this sermon, being reminded of how much God loves us and how much the devil hates us will help me and fight, fight the darkness. So simple, but a reminder that we need more often. All right, awesome. Uh, let's let this person, let's send this person's comments through all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, is that it? Oh, what are some tools we can use to help us rebound? Um, the, the scripture says that God has given you everything you need for life and godliness, and I love that, because that means literally, God's making this promise, he has given me everything I need. There's nothing I lack. So I, ha I know I have the Bible, and I gotta use that. I mean, tools are no good if you don't use them. And you know, some of us have garages full of tools that we never use, but the Bible can't be one of those. You've got, I saw some people looking at their husbands just then, so it's like, yeah. <laughs> Why don't we sell those tools that you never use? Um, but the Bible can't be that. We've got to, we, there's no excuse anymore. It's like it's on every device. You can, you can be reading scripture all the time. God gives us the Holy Spirit, if we're a believer, who lives in us. And Jesus makes a promise that he'll guide us to all truth, that'll comfort us, that'll pray for us, he'll challenge us and convict us. That's a tool that can help us rebound. But I think when it comes to a full rebound, you need other believers. God gave us the gift of the church. We're about to move in a series on Ephesians, which we're calling the big story. It's a, it's a series just looking at the whole book. And it talks about the gift of the church for you and me. What that means, you need other believers. You're not going to go up to a cave and just you and your Bible and come out mature. You're, you need, we do, we do this life on life. So those are the things. You need to be known by people and loved by people who can give you grace and tell you you're not stuck, you can grow, and when you have that, that gives you something called hope. And uh, that's, that's a beautiful thing. You can change. You're not stuck. You can grow. Don't believe the lie that you are stuck. That's what I want to, um, we're gonna listen to a song It's just about the fact that there's a liar out there and we don't have to buy it. So I appreciate it. Just listen to this one. You guys can stay seated, and um, right after this, I'll come back. Let's walk out of here boldly in the victory that Christ has won. May the truth of his defeat over darkness infuse your heart with freedom. May you reject the lies of the enemy and find your identity in Christ alone. And may you walk out of here as deeply loved children of the King. Amen.